Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, pausing with our delay while we got things set up. We are all over the place. As you see, this is not a fake background. Gus is actually in Vegas for this week for an ACA conference. Trust me, if my internet doesn't work so well, that's because I don't think they prioritize internet in Planet Hollywood. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you for joining us in one of our grow sessions around financial modeling and startups. Uh, this is one of our most fun, and the second time we're doing it, it's a financial model teardown. So instead of just going through the basics that uh, Stephen and Logan often do, or how to use your fund your financial model for fundraising, we know it always kind of grounds people when they actually see a real example. You know, the questions we get all the time are, how does this work for a hard tech startup? How does this work for a consumer packaged goods startup? What about a med tech startup? So what we're starting to do is bringing in founders from all different industries and backgrounds and, you know, with companies and startups in different stages to just actually look at real financial models, tear them down and give them feedback to the founders, as well as share that with our community, because we think it really helps just kind of ground the information. And the more you hear the stuff, the, the more likely you'll get better at it. So what we're going to do today, we graciously have two founders with us, uh, David, all the way from Italy. We have John from, I believe you said Oregon, right, John? You give me a thumbs up. I muted you all. <laughs> Uh, and so we're going to go through their models. Uh, I think we'll start with John, but we're also going to get an overview of kind of what their company is, what their startup is, and where they're at. Uh, but before we jump into that, I want to pass it over to Logan uh, to give a little bit of intro to the forecaster team and what we're going to do today. So without, oh, we will record this. Please use the Q&A. If you see stuff that's interesting, you have questions about it, any of the terms, you know, we will make this dynamic, both with the founders we have up on stage today, as well as the audience if we have time. Um, and Logan, take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Much appreciated. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for, I think this is the second iteration of the Financial Model Teardown event. So me and Steven are chomping at the bit here to get in and look at some financial models. We do this all day, every day. Just to give you all a sense of what Forecaster is. Forecaster is an online financial modeling platform. We like to think of ourselves as like a holistic financial planning and analysis platform. We live and breathe financial modeling. This is something that we love. It's something that we do every single day. And we specialize for building financial models for everybody, like people that are like on this call, startup founders, kind of pre-seed up into series A. We do have a parting gift, which Ryan, actually, I don't even think you're aware of. If anybody likes the content for today and they want to submit their financial model to our team for our team to review, I'm going to put a, a link in the chat here. You can fill that out, send us your financial model, and then we will spend some time, our team, over the next couple of days going through it, giving you our thoughts, and kind of tearing down your all's financial models. So today, we're going to be focused on two founders that have graciously uh, stepped up to the stage and, and, and been brave enough to share their financial models with us, uh, which is really, really great. So we're excited to do that. So just give you all a sense of, I think, format that we're going to be targeting. We're going to give each of these two founders five minutes to pitch their business just to talk about what they do outside of the financial model. Then they're going to pivot to sharing their screen and actually going through their financial model. So kind of explaining their business through the lens of their financial model. And then that's going to be kicked to Steven and I, we're going to go through, we're going to give our thoughts on their financial model. So we're going to kind of like tear it down, so to speak. Uh, we'll offer our adjustments and things like that. And then we'll move on to the next founder. We're going to try to leave as much room as we can for Q&A because we know that a lot of people have questions around financial modeling. So if we've done our job, hopefully we'll have, I don't know, like 10, 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. So in order to maximize that, I'm actually going to uh, be quiet now and I'm going to kick it over uh, to David if you want to go first. Um, so what I'm going to do, David, is I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to have you come off mute. I'm going to go ahead and put five minutes on the clock. I'm going to have you pitch. I'll cut you off if you're going long. And then I'm going to have you pivot and then go five minutes in your financial model and talk about that. Okay. So if you're ready, thumbs up. You good? Debbie? Oh, yeah. Okay. We're good. So I'm going to go ahead and start one, two, three, and the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Davide Balbi. The company name is Impacto Zero. And we are a company, a biotech company. We work in agriculture. Uh, I'm a leader of a group of people that believes that uh, we can have more out of agriculture for our health and for, sustain for the sustainability of uh, the world. Um, uh, we studied how the, <clears throat> um, the world is um, having problems with agriculture. So uh, in a modality customer oriented, we started ask, uh, listening to customers and uh, we are giving services for what the customers in agriculture need. So we do analysis intake. Uh, we help them with grants uh, a little bit, you know, uh, with other companies. We have uh, suppliers that give us services 
but our core business is uh, another one. Uh, we, and we use this as commercial leverage to help uh, customers to enter in our um, services. So we studied how the best way to do agriculture is aquaponics. And um, this is a, is a study from a crop diversification center in Alberta, Canada, that shows how the best way to have uh, agriculture is uh, the nitrogenous cycle used in uh, um, aquaponics. This is the difference between hydroponics and aquaponics. This is a result from our laboratory, 25 days. This is a Trinidad scorpion. And this is an alloy that was dying in our in my backyard, and uh, I decided to put it in a aquaponic ecosystem in our laboratory. You can see the differences. So what happens is that uh, for the European community and for the government, uh, aquaponics is uh, like uh, one of the best ways for the future of uh, the European uh, horticulture. And uh, we do reach some sustainable goals from the United Nations. So this is uh, what we think about sustainability. We give a lot of solutions from the fish, uh, commercial fish. Uh, we give solutions to the land that uh, is decreasing for the arable lands. We have a vertical solution we like to use uh, that enables us to bring a lot of plants in the, in the little space. This gives an economy of the heating and the cooler for winter and uh, uh, summer, so we are uh, allergenic free and uh, we bring solution to what happens to lands that are dying and they bring less uh, nutrients to vegetables. So we are we have patents that enables uh, more nutrients inside vegetables and uh, we do not use treatments. So uh, we give health to people. This is very important. We give solution for the freshwater uh, usage that in agriculture is uh, a lot. And uh, we give solution to biodiversity usage because uh, with uh, indoor technology, uh, indoor but greenhouse technology with aquaponics, we can harvest all the crops in the same moment, in the same place. And uh, we, can, uh, we can give the choice for marketing one-to-one, -one, marketing on the farming on demand to customers. So biodiversity will be restored or used. We have patents for the RAS, the recirculating, recirculating aquaculture system that brings more nutrients to plants and, uh, and saves energy. And we have a patent also on IoT uh, sensors, multi-ion sensors, that will be the base for uh, the machine learning that uh, we are searching funds to, to enable in order to have an artificial intelligence that helps farmers to run the ecosystem. And uh, also uh, we are looking forward to create a model where customers may enter our uh, production facility and be producers with us. And um, the base is the farming on demand where people decide what to be used uh, as seed and uh, as ancient seeds also. And uh, we gave them the chance to have a cultivation plan, a yearly cultivation plan. And we change the paradigm of a, a dollar kilo when you purchase a vegetable to renting for a plant spot. All right, David, so, I'm gonna, I got I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna cut you off here. You're at five minutes right now. So that was awesome, really great context. Hopefully everybody has a good understanding of what it is that you all are doing. I'm gonna have you switch now, David, to uh, showing your financial projections and walking us through that. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'll put five minutes on the clock, they're yours to take. And, um, but, but uh, the, floor, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Okay. So financials. Well, um, what we do, uh, we have to, planning the financial model, we have to think to marketing one-to-one -one and what people could like in the same moment, in the same time, in the same place. So there we work with the allocation of the space. I'm sorry the, the economics are wrote in Italian, but the basis are the pH of the plants. So we have to work with uh, a vegetative phase 
and the flowering and fruit phase and different pH. So only with this, we have four different uh, ecosystems uh, with different uh, with a different set of nutrients. We, and we arrived to six. So the basis are four and we arrived to six because we want to do also some tropical and the uh, weathers are getting hot. The climate is getting hotter and hotter. So we need more. And uh, we do work with the allocation of the space also for the zip towers we we are producing in this moment. And uh, this enables us to have a lot of plants in a, a really a little uh, space. And so we give economics to the zip growth for like salads and aromatics and uh, herbs. And we do the same things for plants uh, very high like uh, tomatoes where uh, a, a tomato plant in a long cycle arrives to seven to 13 meters. So um, we work them in a different way. We, we are not able to use the zip towers at all. And then um, we got inside our facility, the a transformation of the product uh, because uh, we need uh, to have the, to ensure ourselves uh, marginality you know, from basil, you can always do pesto or from tomatoes, you can always do the Italian sauce for pasta. So we will have transformation mostly for internal and also international markets. We got packaging cost. Uh, we have the basis of the um, fish turnation inside the, the, the building, uh, inside the greenhouse, we do have fish production. So this is uh, the, the calculation of the fish in entrance and in exit uh, for two years with the valorization of the euro and the, or the dollar in, is the same. In this part, we change what we do. We calculate the revenue for euro kilo, okay? And we have a plan B that is um, organized distribution. That is the lowest price usually in the market. And uh, our economics do work with that. And then we have uh, uh, the change to farming on demand. That doesn't uh, think anymore uh, about the dollar kilo. You know, you sell one kilo of tomato for X dollars. Uh, we change that. And uh, we enable customers not to think anymore to production but uh, they think we enable them to think for on a renting space so they can it doesn't matter which is the production or if they want an ancient seed that maybe is doing one only only one tomato for plants for example but if the customers want that product it's uh, priceless so we change the paradigm which we switch for the plan a you know for the good margins to a renting uh, plant spot and we calculate the cost of the plant spot a little bit higher than the euro kilo uh, um, uh, turnover uh, billings that we could have, the margins, you know, it's gonna be higher. And uh, then we decide how much are the packages, uh, how, how many plant spot customers may ask, and then we arrive to let's see uh, to calculate the revenue for the um, ROI, the return on an investment. So we have a we have a positive uh, ROI in the fourth year. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you are right at time. Also, we are right at five minutes. So we're going to go ahead and kick it over to myself and Stephen to offer feedback. Uh, Stephen, I'll kick it over to you first, and then I'll, I'll kind of bring it up after uh, you share your thoughts. Okay, cool. Uh, are you going to pull the model back up? or, or... You're talking about uh, with David? Is David going to pull the model oh, back I was up? Asking, I was asking you, but yeah, David can pull it back up yeah, too. I think it'd be, be helpful to, to, kind of, to kind of see it. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I mean, thank you for for kind of walking us through this and giving us kind of a window into your business. Uh, super cool business, by the way, um, and definitely one of uh, one of the more complicated, you know, financial models and business models. I would say I've built 
a few hundred financial models in my day and, and some of the models like this that have a lot of production assumptions and, and facility assumptions and stuff like that um, could be really, really, really challenging to, to build. So a couple of points I'll, I'll say. One is um, you have a lot of good detail in here with respect to the like production assumptions, the assumptions that are critical for um you know, kind of like how the basically like the internal operations of the of the facility and, and things like that. Um, so I think that is uh, it is definitely good to see. I think for a business like yours, uh, both from an operational perspective, you know, getting those you know assumptions, those kind of metrics right, is going to be really important. Um, and from an investor's perspective, you know, I think when you're presenting the model to investors it'll be critical for you to, I think, you know, communicate to investors that you really have a good understanding, you know, of your, of your domain, which for, from, for me is, is clear. I think um, one of the kind of the, the bigger missing pieces for me, you know, that I, that I, that I haven't seen in this model is really, um, really kind of a good, good forecasting around um, the, the sales and essentially like the customer acquisition mechanics. So like, you know, how are you acquiring, you know, customers? What channels are you using? What's that process look like? And, and, and that kind of thing. I think that's, okay, that's an area that, that you could really kind of expand on in this, in this, in this model um, is, is this like, you know, how are, how are you going out and getting those customers? What is the work that you guys are doing? Either do direct selling, or or maybe you're working with uh, larger entities or something like that. I think that would be beneficial. And then and then one of the and then one thing that that I know Logan and I always look for in a great financial model is monthly forecasting that goes out through time. So you have a lot of good assumptions in here around you know production and even like revenue generation and things like that. Uh, but I think what we would want to see um, is like a monthly model that goes out through time. And that way you can see how does revenue change month over month over the coming years? How do those expenses change over the coming years? And then what does that tell us about, you know, kind of the, the business as it scales? And, and then for you, when you operationalize the business, you know, it'll be, it'll be important to have those 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 like that forecasts on a monthly basis, so that you can update it with actual data, and you can kind of hold yourself, you know, accountable in that way. Um, so I, I think that would be definitely like a a, a big improvement, and and having um, you know clear tabs in 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 the model for your financial statements, you know, um, like the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, monthly, you know, going out through time. Yeah, that's that kind of core financial output that we always look for in a financial model that I think really helps, really helps, you know, kind of glean insight regarding the business, both for you running the business and then also for investors trying to quickly get up to speed, you know, um, with the with the fundamentals of the business. So that would be those would be some some that would be some feedback from from me. Um, Logan, what, a, yep. what do you think? Yep. So I'll come in and give you mine. So first of all, uh, I'll start with the good. So uh, Debbie, I think that you did a really good job in demonstrating your expertise in the space. I think that one thing that's very clear in this model is that there's a lot of data in here and it's very difficult, I think, for somebody to just get up and walk through all of the nuanced mechanics of your business, especially in front of a crowd of a lot of different people. So uh, kudos to you for that. And I think that that's a major box that's checked whenever you whenever you perform something like this. And that's one of the biggest boxes I think investors look for is, does this person know their business? I think for this, the, the answer is an overwhelming yes. Um, in terms of just the structure of the model, I think while it is thoughtful, it is also a bit of a mess, if I'm being honest. So if I'm getting into this model, let's mm -hmm. say I'm an investor and I'm trying to understand your business, it is going to take me all afternoon and part of tomorrow probably to have to actually go in and try to backtrack all of the calculations, try to understand the logic, try to understand everything that's actually going on here. I think that if we could be very concise and just kind of understanding what is the holistic output of this financial model, just to say, this is the light at the end of the tunnel. This is ultimately what we're building towards. And now let me just stair step you into what is actually happening here. 
if I'm being frank, I found myself getting a little bit lost in your presentation. And it's like one of those things that, you know, can just tend to happen whenever you're very deep tech, whenever you're deep in the weeds on your business. But that is something that, that I just wanted to call out for you is that it could be very concise. It could be, um, you know, it could be a little bit simpler. Um, I'll note there, this is kind of like a presentation flow thing. Uh, I always, uh, whenever I coach people on how to present their financial models, start an aggregate. So I like to start at the uh, total revenue, total expenses. What is your net income? What are you projecting? The success of the business long-term and then back us into the details from there. So that way I've got my, I've wet my appetite. I understand kind of what I'm looking to invest towards, what the ultimate outcome is going to be. Now take me deep into the weeds of your business and kind of like, and, and just kind of like surface some information kind of to me as I'm digesting it. So those are kind of the biggest key points uh, that I wanted to take away, uh, wanted you to take away here. Now I will so uh, show you all kind of something that we did, which is we took a very high level, um, I'm gonna steal the screen from you, took a little bit of the high level data from your all's business from the financial model that you submitted. And we kind of reframed it, repackaged it in a way that we would have liked to have seen this. And we of course used our own software because we're a software company. Uh, but essentially what we like to do is kind of cleanly parse like parse out the different um the different aspects of the model so we would like to see specifically how are you getting customers right this is your customer acquisition section where you can show how you're bringing new people into the business into the and, then, and then how are you going to monetize them once they're done and then once you and notice how we're layering in value right we start at the high level with revenue and now if i want to go deeper then I can. And whenever I do go deeper, it's going to show me which cells are inputs and which cells are outputs. Those are kind of the blue cells, which are the inputs and the black cells, which are the outputs. And it's got some like nice kind of like dashboard reporting as well in here, just some out of the box type of stuff. But then you could also start an aggregate kind of like on your income statement just to show this is the light at the end of the tunnel. This is what we expect to do after six years. And now I can kind of back you into that to show you what is your specific roadmap for how you're going to do that. So I'll we'll, we'll share this link with you after the event's done. So if you want to dig in, then you can. This link doesn't have an expiration date. You can you can feel free to use it as your at your discretion. Um, and then if you of course want to talk to us about you know how we can how we can operate operationalize this better, uh, we can have a conversation about that. But great job, David. I think that you did an amazing job with that. I think you clearly are uh, a good founder. You have a good understanding of your business and. Uh, you know, kudos to you for, for getting up in front of people and, and uh, showing off what you've done. So good, good work all around. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Okay. Well, good work. Round of applause. I know that everybody's muted. So uh, for David, so just maybe do it on your own. Uh -huh. But now we're going to go ahead and move on to the next founder. So John is going to be joining us. So John, uh, whenever you're ready, it's going to be the same deal. I'm going to give you five minutes, pitch your business. Then I'm going to do five minutes for you to pitch whatever financials you want to, you want to present to us. Steve and I will jump in for feedback. And I think that should leave us some time for Q&A for, for the audience as well. So uh, John, whenever, whenever you're ready, uh, just come off mute and uh, you can go ahead and uh, give it your pitch. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to show you guys my pitch deck. Um, I have it ready, but I don't know how to get it on the screen with you guys. Yeah, Ryan, do you want to, I think he should be oh, able yeah. to. Give me one second. I didn't set you up as a co-host yet. John, uh, oh, maybe. One minute all right you should have an affordance uh down in the bot in the bottom center there should be a green share screen button i see that um and you can do if you click okay. that, you i i, I figured all right pitch deck and share okay here we go we got it so what i have is a very simple product it's something i used to race bicycles it's something that should have been changed 30 maybe 50 years ago and hasn't it's been an ongoing problem and i couldn't believe there was a patent still available for this i thought it was such a simple thing um so a bicycle gets a flat tire all the time and the patch kits they have give you multiple patches they give you like 15 patches and they give you one small tube of glue well that tube of glue frequently dries out and leaves you stranded which happened to me. This is how this whole thing started. I had three used patch kits. They all were dried up. So I was walking to the bicycle shop thinking to myself, well, why doesn't every patch come with its own glue? And so I went and researched that. I, well, research. I went to Alibaba. <laughs> and if Alibaba doesn't have it, it doesn't exist. And so uh, they didn't have it on Alibaba. 
Um, so I went to the U.S. Patent Office, and nobody had ever patented it. And so I went ahead and got a patent for it, which was a real hassle. But I ended up with some really crappy investors. Um, I should also preface this. In 97, I was hit by a drunk driver, and I received disability. It's not like I receive a lot of income, so I don't have a lot of income to throw around for this business. So I'm trying to find founders, investors right now, because I, I do need help. And what we have is the second page, mission statement, bringing economical flat, uh, repeatable flat repair to bicycle riders around the world. And it's not just bicycle riders. It's any vehicle that takes an inner tube, but bicycle riders are my primary market. And am I going too fast, too slow? Okay. The problem is, you know, flat tires occur. Like I said, if that little tube of glue dries out of you, it's inconvenient in town. It's devastating when you're 20 miles from town on a trail somewhere. Um, so this has been a much needed product. And then you read the small blurb on the end, 1.1 um, billion bicycles in the world, a bicycle that's flat tire just in America alone, which is not my primary market. I've already understand that. Asia and Africa, I think, will be my primary markets. Um, 47,670 bikes are produced daily. That's a lot of bikes. And then the same thing I was just saying, it's self-contained. Um, I know you don't have it in your hand, but the potential for advertising is huge with this thing. It's, it's much bigger than a regular patch kit. Um, I have a team. I have myself. Obviously, I used to race bicycles. I published a couple books. I had a uh, startup a long time ago, a clothing company. I ended up selling it. Um, and then I have a business partner, a founder, and I, I'm looking for others. Um, milestones, funding date, uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, really nothing there. I, I haven't produced. Oh, okay. Let me tell you the basics of thing. The ones that I have, I produce by hand um, because it's one thing to tell a person, hey, I've got this great idea. They're going to tell you, big deal. But if you hand something, somebody in their hand, and they can look at it and open it, and they'll say, that's cool. Okay, that's the reason I produce it by hand. But the problem I have is if I bust my butt and don't do anything else all day, I can maybe get 100. And I've got REI and Shimano on the line already, and they're going to present me orders for 100,000. And so it's impossible for me to fill those orders. And because it's a newly patented product, the machines do not currently exist to manufacture it. I mean, different machines to do different things, but I need to combine them somehow. And that's what I need money for right now is to figure out how to, how to uh, manufacture this thing in wholesale quantities. Um, the market opportunity, um, the US $5.85 billion in, uh, in 2023, that's a lot of money. Um, it doesn't really cover the patch thing. I mean, the patch things, like I said, have been the same for, 50, 70 years, and they've had that flaw in them. Nobody's ever tried to modify, which I was amazed to see that nobody had ever done that. The set, it, it goes on basically like a regular patch. There's nothing special about that at all. And then blah, 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 pre-glued. So it has glue in there. It's a comparison. They do sell pre-glued patches. But if you go to any bike shop in the world with a flat tire, they're not going to give you a pre-glued patch because they just don't stick. So I had to make this with um, balkanizing cement, and that was hard. That's why I have a Mylar pack. I wanted to make it as recyclable as possible, and that's the one part I couldn't do. It, that, that glue will pretty much eat anything. Um, traction, not a lot right now. Um, like I said, I live in rural Oregon. I'm not exactly surrounded by financial gurus. Um, the people up here that have money, they're leaving it to their kids and the story. Um, so I, I'd like to go down to California and pitch this to somebody that has a little um, business sense, perhaps. Hey, John, um, I'm going to cut you off there because you have hit, you've hit your five minute mark. Okay. That's a good, good timing because we just got to the financial piece, uh, needed, needing some financial folks. So I think what, what now would be great would be if you could transition to the financials that you submitted. Um, and then we can do the same thing, throw five minutes on the clock and you can walk us through them and then we can go for feedback. Okay. Can you guys see this? There are, uh, we can. Okay. Sure can. Yep. Um, so the financials well, were we put together we by the, my, we can't I'm see sorry. the model. We can't see the model. We can still see, see the dent. 
Oh, okay. Let's see. How do I get the model to you guys? I don't see the little brown uh, green dot at the bottom. Yeah, I think if you uh, if you stop sharing, you should be able to start sharing again. And I think you might have just shared this window when you want to share just like the whole screen. Or oh, I see. So let me uh, you are screen sharing. Let me let's see if I can figure this out. Okay, okay. Here we go. Stop and restart it. Yep. Now let's see if I can get share screen. Okay, can you see it? Okay. Oh, okay. So like I said, these financials were put together by my uh, founder partner um, because I, I had no, I, I had made them by hand. So I knew what it took to make one by hand. I, I know the price of everything, but I was buying my products in small quantities off Amazon. And the problem that I had with that is that I couldn't guarantee quality control when you buy small quantities for Amazon. And so I'd come down the next morning and 60 of the 100 patch kits I worked on the day before would be flat because there was a problem with a packet or blah, 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 a problem with something. So I, I couldn't sell them. And that's when I decided I need to manufacture them. I'm well aware that I could send it over to Alibaba and have somebody make it over there. But the Chinese intellectual property laws are very lax. And somebody will steal it, and I just don't have the money to fight it right now. And so that's why I want to put a manufacturing plant here in America. And so these financials, I mean, like I said, materials per pack cost me about 95 cents per pack. Um, sales price wholesale would be around 250. I have been selling them uh, to bike shops and everything for five bucks a piece. Um, other than that, I don't really know what to say because the machines don't exist to make it. I do not know how many I could produce in a day. And without knowing that, I, I mean, I realized I, I can't really do sales figures right now. I have all these corporations interested, but if I can't produce them, it's kind of pointless. So I'm in this gray area where I need money for research, basically. And that's why I'm looking for a founder. And, and please feel free to read it. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I didn't highlight anything. All right. Well, that sounds, that sounds great, John. Um, so definitely appreciate you doing that, walking us through that. Uh, Steven, you want to do the same flow? Do you want to get, do you want to go first or would you prefer me to, so, you know, whatever, whatever you'd like? I'm, ha I'm happy to go first. Um, John, really appreciate it. And uh, sounds like a really interesting business. I mean, clearly a big market. Um, I could see, you know, you're getting pretty good margins, uh, you know, on, on, on the business and, and it's interesting, you know, it, it's definitely, definitely interesting. Something I'm not, a, I'm not much of a, of a biker, so I didn't, I didn't really know, but uh, yeah, su su super interesting to hear kind of your story and, and to see this model. So, you know, um, in reviewing this model, seeing it on the screen and reviewing it beforehand, I'd say, you know, it's a very simple kind of first swag at a, at a financial model. Like you've got some <laughs> Basic, you know, expense assumptions in there based on, you know, it's kind of high level what you'd sell it for, the you know, materials. And then I, I and then you have kind of an assumption if you scroll down, I think a little bit it is where if you sell 20,000 packs a month, you can make 30, 31,000 a month. If you sell 40,000 packs a month, then it's more than that. And you and you kind of do like some rough, rough math just to see directionally, um, you know, is this you know, can, can we make money doing this? And I think that generally speaking, when you're really early on in a business's life cycle, it can make a lot of sense to start with something like this. Basically, like before you kind of, before you're, you know, convinced that you're going to basically build the business, build, do the whole thing, starting out with a real, just kind of rough, rough swag at it, basically asking yourself, hey, do the numbers roughly make sense? Um, and I think, you know, and, and so once you take it to this point, you say, yeah, I think the numbers do make sense. I think where you can go from here, you know, to really make this a kind of a, um, a real financial model that you can use operationally to, you know, make business decisions as well as, you know, in, in a fundraising process to convince investors. I think what you can do, you know, is really um, kind of do two main things for me. One is kind of expand you know horizontally in a sense and so you want this model to be structured in a way where you have assumptions regarding uh, your customer acquisition process which for you will largely be you know larger retailers and a sales cycle and an initial order and orders that will grow over time like some some assumptions around when you're going to close deals how much they're going to order and how that might change over time knowing that there it's all going to be guesses and assumptions right but give 
give yourself an, an idea of what it could look like and investors an idea of like, what is the sales process? Is it a direct sales process or these pretty large contracts? How do they expand over time? I think that'll give you a better sense of customer acquisition and revenue, you know, better than just kind of saying roughly, what if I sold 20,000 a month? What if I sold 40,000 a month? Like, you know, how many deals would I have to get done and, and, and how, how would they start and how would they go? So this kind of like, you know, month over month kind of forecast of, 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 of contracts and, and your order volume. And then from there, you know, you can, you can feed in some of these expense assumptions that tie to it, either as a percentage of revenue or, or per unit, you know, like, like you've done here. And then you'll work your way kind of down into like into the people. Like I think for you, it, it would largely be important to have uh, a direct sales team over time that would be executing on that. You know, you'd have to figure out if you're going to outsource or kind of like do the do the production in house. So what kind of direct labor costs that you have? So I think that would be the next kind of layer I would go is really starting to get more specific with you know who you're going to hire, when you're going to hire them, how that relates to the to the business. So just kind of those more granular expense assumptions and and similar to what you know we talked about with with Davide, like you know monthly it's a monthly model going out through time that way you know to to Logan's point on the prior model and, and we can show it here on this one as well that way you have that kind of operational model that's going out through time that you can use to understand and see how does your revenue scale over time when do you turn a profit how does how does your expense base, you know, scale through time. Um, and then like, what does that look like if you were to roll it up, you know, into an annual view kind of bird's eye? That would be like the next step I would take with this to really make the model something that you can use operationally and for that like storytelling process and fundraising. And to your point, you know, a lot of the assumptions are going to be guesses because you're early on in the business because these equi this equipment doesn't exist and that kind of stuff. You're going to have to take rough swags. Uh, but I think what my advice would be on the model there would be really, um, you know, kind of uh, be conservative in those assumptions, try to forecast more costs than you than you think it might be there for the equipment and things like that, because everything you know, takes more money and, and takes more time. So just try to really beef that up. So that way, you know, if you are going out and raising capital, you're, you're hopefully raising more than you need and not less than you need and putting yourself in a, in a cash crunch. And then, and then I would also you know, um, you know, kind of maybe push you to say, be really conservative with the sales assumptions as well. Maybe assume that some of those big deals, um, you know, just, um, you know, like uh, start, start kind of small and go up from there. So you can kind of have assumptions that kind of like, uh, you know, go up over time. But uh, Logan, what, what, uh, that, that, those would be kind of my, my thoughts on this model. All good thoughts, Stephen. So yeah, let me give you mine. And John, you asked me not to go easy on you. So I'm not going to go easy go on you. Uh, my biggest qualm with this is that it's really not a financial model, not in the traditional sense. This is more, it's, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. I don't want to say that. But a financial model, generally speaking, is a projection of the big three financial statements. It is the income statement, the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows going out into the future so that if I'm an investor, I am, I am being presented with a financial outcome in the uh, structure in which I am most familiar right? I'm familiar with an income statement. I'm familiar with the balance sheet. I'm familiar with the statement of cash flows. What this is, is it's kind of a series of back of the envelope revenue estimates, which again, doesn't mean that it doesn't have any value, but it does mean that if you're looking to kind of submit a financial model or, you know, really look at a financial model, um, it's not fitting my traditional sense of what I expect to see whenever I see a financial model. Okay. Now you also kind of fall into the trap that a lot of early stage companies fall into, uh, which is a really, really difficult one to navigate, which is you yourself don't understand uh, what the cost implications are going to be for your own business because you're so early, right? So you mentioned that you don't know what it's going to cost to build these machines. You don't know what the capacity is going to look like. Therefore, you don't know what the sales through code is going to be, right? Correct. Those are, yes. those are th that's very, very challenging. And I understand kind of like the the difficulty of having to forecast with so many unknowns. But if you look at it from the other end of the table, from an investor standpoint, if you yourself don't have any kind of understanding of what the future economics of the business is going to look like, you're asking me to kind of invest on a whim and a prayer that hopefully you find that out and hopefully they're to my liking and hopefully you can scale it, right? So what I would challenge you to do, John, 
is I would say, even though there are unknowns, take inventory of the unknowns and do the best that you can to kind of remove the fog from the room and try to get as much clarity or as, or at least more clarity uh, you know, around this than you can. So like go to manufacturers and just ask them like, what is reasonable? What is realistic? What do similar looking machines cost, right? What is kind of like a ridiculous output volume? What's a conservative output volume? Things like that. Square that with what you're thinking in price and what you see for other things in the market. And then just try to get as much clarity as you possibly can around those types of assumptions before you go and ask investors for dollars. So once you can kind of get a better sense of what the future looks like, you can then take those into a financial model and say, given these conversations that I've had, given kind of my research that I've done, given these contacts that I've gotten in contact with in the industry, I can take this data, I can plug it into this framework of thinking, and it produces these results, which in my opinion are conservative because of X, Y, Z. Then you can take those two investors and then you can talk to them about investing in your company. So that's kind of the framework that I think is really important for navigating uncertainty specifically whenever it comes to financial modeling. Okay, that's my biggest, that's my biggest point uh, that, I can, that I can kind of instill onto you. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I don't think this is a great financial model at all. Um, that's why I was saying I, I would like a founder, somebody who under, I mean, I invented this thing. I designed it. I patented it, uh, blah, blah, blah. And here we are at the financial part. And I, I'm not sure I really want to learn this. Yep. No, it's totally understandable, John. And it's something that I think a lot of people kind of like, and I will say, you know, uh, the, the power is in kind of like admitting strengths, admitting weaknesses. You seem like a very strong entrepreneur. You've had a successful business in your past. You know what you want to do. You've identified a good opportunity. You've identified a great market and things like that. So don't get discouraged, you know, or anything like that. I just think that like, that's, that's kind of like the area in my mind, whenever I'm looking at companies, just getting as much clarity in the murkiness, you know, as you possibly can. I think that gives you a much more powerful narrative whenever you go and ask um, for dollars from, from investors. Yeah, so I made it to round two of Pepperdine's most fundable companies in America. Should I redo this and send them a new copy of this? Uh, not if you've already sent it to them, I would say, you know, don't necessarily optimize for it. I would, I mean, if you have the time, I would say it's always good to kind of strengthen the pitch as best as you can. So okay. I would say now that you kind of identified maybe a weaker point, you know, in the, in the pitch, like kind of like a weaker section, then I would say, you know, this might be an area to kind of strengthen it. Uh, but then another, another thing that you could do is just kind of like, for now, just say, look, we're still doing some validation on the economics. You know, we're still kind of like talking to, you know, folks about what the future could look like. So you could present this, but I would say we're still kind of like in the figure it out mode. Um, okay. So that, that would be my advice. Um, okay. And I would be remiss if I didn't show kind of, we did, our team did take the information that you gave uh, similar uh, to oh, the okay. And we put this together. So I'll actually just show you super quick. Uh, kind of our thoughts and again we didn't have any information just kind of like you didn't have any information but just to show you the framework it's very similar thinking from the bottoms up first how am i getting customers how am i going to market this so you know you've got like direct consumer maybe you're doing advertising maybe you're investing in seo so you're getting organic leads you know maybe you've got wholesale partners that you've got that you're that you're kind of like funneling. that's what i'm looking for uh originally yeah. i was going to customize everyone for individual bike shops in america do you know how many bike shops there are in this country? So I, I thought know. about it. I need, I need to go to Shimano. And then I went to REI. And they're really interested in it. And if I was to get REI, I'd be buying a condo time. Um, yeah. But the problem with REI is they don't want to manufacture it. They yeah. only want to distribute it. Same with Shimano. They don't want to manufacture it. They only want to distribute it. And that's why I'm into manufacturing right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's very smart. And I would say, yeah, I mean, we kind of do the bottoms up, we make our way to the revenue streams, we get all the assumptions that we can think of, just kind of your best guess of what the future of the business is going to look like. And then it goes into, like I kind of mentioned, the big three financial statements. So you see, we've got the income statement, we can see how we're generating revenue, we get a good understanding of what our costs are, who are we going to hire? How is this going to scale? All of that stuff, just making you really think, I think, quite a lot about your business. And then you can just understand the cash flow impacts, what that's going to look like. All of that is going to be really, really important whenever it comes to just kind of like thinking through, uh, thinking through your business. So I did want to thank you that. for redoing it. Yeah, no problem. No problem. And, and we'll share that link with you just like we will at the beat. So you'll be able to dig through that 
and then a member of our team will reach out just in case you have any questions or anything like that. And we can see how we can help you. So okay, thank uh, you. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, so thanks both of you all. Like I, like I said, tremendous amount of courage it takes to get up and really present your financial model in front of a big group of people. You both did a great job. You're both great founders, clearly. Uh, and I did want to make sure that we did have time for uh, for questions. And we do have 11 minutes left. And I saw a bunch of questions come through. Um, so maybe Ryan, Calvin, I'll kick it to you all to uh, see which ones make sense to answer. Yeah, I'm gonna, so Calvin, yeah oh, Calvin, you take care of the questions, but I did want to say, John, while you were presenting, like three people in the chat were like, I am a biker and this is a problem. So you might want to drop your email address or something in the chat just because you might have three direct sales. Uh, but Calvin, take it away. Perfect. So I guess uh, we'll go with the most recent question first um, from Farzad. Do you offer a free trial of Forecaster? Um, so we do not do a free trial of Forecaster, although we do do a 30 day money back guarantee. So the reason that we don't do a free trial with Forecaster is because the way that our uh, platform works is that we pair every customer up with a financial analyst that's an expert in finance. Their job is to do kind of exactly what John was uh, looking for, provide that expert level guidance. So look at your business, understand where the gaps are, do kind of what me, Stephen, and I did today, but then help you rebuild your financial model or help you supercharge your financial model. It's really hard to do that with a free trial because there's a lot of human component that goes into that. So instead, we don't do that. We actually lean the other way and only do annual software subscriptions. But if at the end of 30 days, whenever we're, you're in theory should be onboarded, you think that it's not a good fit, you didn't get what you were looking for, uh, then we refund you your money in full, no questions asked. So that's kind of our, um, that's kind of our uh, version, I guess, of a free trial. Uh, but yeah. Awesome. It looks like uh, the next question we have lined up here is from uh, Anthony Thompson. Uh, how do you set up projections for a company if you have four different types of returning revenue for projects you you want to perform for a customer? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so I can take my stab at this. So uh, in general, what you would want to do is you'd want to understand the mechanics of each individual revenue stream, and you'd want to model them each within the same financial model. So like Forecaster is a good example of this, where we have annual software subscriptions, but we also have CFO services. So if you need a CFO, then we can you know, pair you up with somebody on our team that is a CFO uh, level expert that can provide expert guidance. So if you look at our financial model, we literally have two lines. We have one for services and then one for SaaS. Same deal if you have like a SaaS plus a marketplace, if you have a SaaS plus transactions, anything like that, you would wanna build a revenue stream that's specific. The revenue formula has to be unique for that specific revenue stream, but they all fit within the confines of the same financial model. Something that we do really well at Forecaster uh, is we can take inventory of all of your different financial streams, put them all together, and then help you tell a story with um, all of them together. Cool. And it looks like we do have a few questions in regards to pricing. So uh, Stephen or Logan, if you guys wanted to cover a little bit about what Forecaster costs. Yeah, sure. Sure thing. Do you want to go, Stephen? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, we start at $2,000 a year, an annual subscription, uh, which is which is paid up front and includes that white glove onboarding like Logan mentioned. And then we do offer 25% off uh, to anybody in the Gus community. Yes. Um, so love working with Gus companies. We've got dozens and dozens of of companies are all amazing companies always when they when they come out of the guest community. So it is 25% off. So uh, typically about $1,500 is the start. And then um, it does kind of scale up, scale up from there based on the, the, the size of your business. Um, and Calvin can share a, a link to, to, uh, to get started if, if, if you're interested in that, but appreciate the question. Cool. And there is a link there. It's just three messages up. So if you are interested, uh, we did drop it a couple times there. Um, looks like the next question we'll move on to is uh, Mark Durzan. Logan, can you share an example, and maybe not physically, or maybe so, um, of, a, of a financial model you like? It seems, um, it seems to me the thought process is here. How does one articulate this well? An example of what you're discussing would help. Yeah, I will do that actually really quickly. I'll take maybe a minute, minute and a half, and I can show you our financial model. If that sounds good to you all. Um, I've got it up right now, so I might as well show it. Um, and I just made you all show us your financial model. So it's only fair, I think, for uh, us to show you ours. <laughs> um, so so uh, yeah, so this is Forecaster's financial model. Now, what we're looking at right now, we have many different versions of our financial model. So we have, you know, a bunch of different scenarios. This one's our active model. It's the one that we're not really fundraising with. We're mainly just planning cash around and things like that. Um, so it's the same deal. So we do bottoms up financial modeling at Forecaster, where we try to identify specifically how are we going to grow? And we use this to communicate growth targets throughout our entire team. So I'll take May as just an example where we're saying we're going to get 54 new clients. 
how are we going to get those 50, 40 clients? Well, the bulk of them are going to come from strategic networks. If I expand that, I can understand all of the different levers that I have in order to get these clients. So I know I need 200 partners, roughly 199, giving us 0.42 leads per partnership. And this goes to leads, to deals, to customers, and so on and so forth. Okay. Those then feed into our financial statements so we, or our revenue streams, where we can see this is kind of what I touched on earlier. We have uh, annual subscriptions, but then we have support and services as well, right? I'll note here that one of the benefits of Forecaster is we can plug in our actual data. So this is all being powered by QuickBooks. You can see the little QuickBooks logo here. Um, and then you can see variances as well right there just by clicking that, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of one of the benefits. But then we can go into all of the costs. You can understand all of the different people that you have in the business that are helping produce these results, all the expenses, and they all need to roll up nicely into the big three financial statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows. So um, if you want to dig in deeper, anybody wants to dig in and understand what a great financial model looks like at a, at a deeper level, please get in contact with us. We'll, we'll get on a call with you. We'll, we'll run you through all of that and make sure that you have a really clear understanding of what that looks like. Awesome. And it uh, looks like we have some questions. It looks like a couple around um, like early startups, pre-revenue. Um, so we'll start with Elias here. Do the three-year forecast suffice for a pre-revenue company for fundraising purposes? Yeah. I think a, a three-year forecast uh, certainly can suffice. Uh, we 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 you know believe that five years is always best, just because a lot of times in three years, if you're really early, you're probably still not like you know really a big business or maybe a big profitable business at that time, depending on how you're trying to build the business. But certainly, if you're going after venture scale, so from a fundraising perspective, what you want to do is pick a long enough time horizon where you can show the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and show how you're going to get there. And a lot of times that's going to be five years, kind of at least, you know what I mean? And so you, you, you don't have to worry about being really accurate in those out years. It's just story. Like be really accurate in the 18 to 24 months that you actually have some level of visibility into. Try to hold yourself accountable. Try to really ask yourself, is that really how I think it's going to go? Because that's the time horizon you're going to raise on. That's kind of the, the you know, the, the, the kind of window of time that, that you're going to need to, you know, really really manage cash on and stuff like that. But then years three, four, and five, it's 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 storytelling. Just tell a story of how you're going to become a large company. Now it needs to be reasonable. It needs to be fair, right? Um, but 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 you don't need to agonize over the out years. Just make it kind of directional to convey that, hey, this is going to be a big business, a successful business that generates really positive ROI. And we've critically thought through the assumptions of how this business is going to scale. We may not have all the answers and likely don't, but we've thought through it. We've critically thought through it and we can and we can and we can communicate that. Right. It's a lot about articulating and communicating and that kind of stuff. So five years is what we would we would suggest. And usually if you've built a three year model and you've done it monthly, you can just take that last month and like drag it out and make it a five year model. Or, of course, if you do use something like Forecaster, then you can do a two, five, 10, 20 year model all, all in one, um, which is nice. Really cool. Awesome feedback there. And it looks like a Wazia has a, a question that's along a similar thread. Uh, Wazia here, I have a medical device for regenerative medicine to facilitate autogalous, a I'm going to just attempt that word there, autogalous stem cell therapy. I have some idea now on the CAC and sales in India, but need to calculate, calculate that for the U.S. market. As a pre-revenue company, um, what do I add in the financial model for the U.S. market? I do have a total revenue slash total cost per year. That has been split into statements right from expenses, revenue, P and L, et cetera. We'll share that from your. We'll share that provided soon. So, so I guess the question is revolving around how, how do you get the assumptions that essentially power the model uh, if you're still pre-revenue, if you're still early on. Yeah. So that's a great. It's a great question. And if if I understand kind of like the you know synopsis there, it sounds like you've got some good CAC validation based out of India. So you kind of roughly know. What your cost to acquire customer is in India, and you don't quite know what it's going to be in the U.S. yet, if, I, if I'm understanding that correctly. Uh, but regardless, I think that the answer is like a lot of this you're just not going to know. Like you can you your job, I think, is before you go out and really put a lot, uh, ask for a lot of money, or like really really try to get around that is try to remove as many unknowns as you possibly can. So if you're based in India and you have an understanding what the CAC is there, and now you want to understand what it is in the U.S you know, run the same process that you use to understand the CAC in India and try to do it in the US, like maybe run paid ads using US, you know, as a target or something like that. 
uh, maybe like talk to other people in a similar industry, kind of like in the US, that type of thing. Uh, but if not, and you're just kind of validating it from the ground floor, um, you know, I would just try to do some sort of a discovery process to try to understand what your CAC is going to be by either doing tests with paid ads, or maybe just kind of like, you know, trying to cold sell uh, whatever, you know, a product that doesn't exist yet. There's a number of different strategies that you can use um, to do that. So uh, great question. And then we're, you know, I'm, we can always dig in more uh, if you want to get in touch with one of our, our teammates. Um, I think I want to opine on this one just a little bit because a lot of people when they're in the pre-revenue stage, they're like, why would I need a financial model? Everything's, you know, made up. But the thing is, once you have it, you can use those kind of questions to play with assumptions. So if it's like, all right, what if we had the exact same CAC when we went into the US and you can see what it would look like? What is that worth? You say, what if it was three times as much or what if it was half as much? And just being able to play those things and seeing what the results are, seeing when your model gets ridiculous or seeing when it actually points to something to look into can really give you, you know, some strategic you know, direction in terms of actually what you do next in a pre-revenue startup because you know, everything is a guess, right? But, you know, prioritizing your guesses based on the ones that might have the biggest payoff or learn the most is one of the most effective ways to actually start to build early traction. 100%, Ryan. So thank you so much for that input. Um, I will say that we're at the top of the hour. I'm unfortunately going to have to jump as I think Stephen does as well. So I would just kind of close it off by saying, we really appreciate both the founders that have presented, but everybody else that's come here to take a look at this. I mean, I think this is a great event. We love doing this. Um, it is our aspiration to continue doing these events at a regular cadence, uh, just because they do seem to be really, really popular. We get a lot of value. Uh, please do take us, if you do have a financial model, you have any questions about, take us up on the opportunity to submit using that form, that type form that we sent in the chat. Um, that would be, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll gladly kind of go through. Yeah, thank you, Calvin, for, for resubmitting that. Um, otherwise, if you do, if you, we didn't roast your model today and you do want to roast it in the future at one of these events live, uh, just be on the lookout. I'm sure, Ryan, you'll follow up with kind of event details and stuff like that, but we'll be sure to, to try to get you in the flow. But thank you all so much for coming out. This is an awesome event. Yep. And look out for future ones. We'll, our Q&As are getting ridiculous, but we'll keep doing this programming and come back for those uh, and we'll have some more stuff. And thank you very much, Forecaster team, John, uh, Davide, sorry, I said David instead <laughs> the French versus the Italian version. Uh, have a great week, everybody. And uh, we will see you again soon. Thanks so much, y'all. Bye.